Yes, you can see. Okay, yes, that's like, oh, yes, you can see, like, oh, Peter, how can you be so stupid? Yes, yeah, I also think that. <laughs> Check the microphone and then forget it to enable that. Well, anyway, anybody trying to listen online, I am sorry. My fault entirely. Uh, but uh, we didn't get the good stuff yet. So, uh, hang on. Well, uh, Kubernetes, right? Going back to uh, the Kubernetes, which became uh, ubiquitous. And another thing uh, which is interesting in Kubernetes in relation to the databases is what Kubernetes was designed first for uh, stateless applications, right? I mean, if you think about that uh, in the early version of Kubernetes, running database of on Kubernetes would be uh, oxymoron because, well, the database is where the state is, right? And the idea was, well, you know what? We'll have a database somewhere, and that's where state will be kept, so we can have our stateless applications in Kubernetes. But you know, as with many things, uh, uh, they evolve, uh, and people started to want to have a database on Kubernetes too, right? So you don't have to manage two different kinds of environments. And Kubernetes became much better in the recent, uh, uh, recent years. Uh, for handling those stateful applications such as, uh, mm, uh, such as uh, um, databases. And you can uh, uh, see the Kubernetes operators, and that is kind of a way how you, uh, how you run their uh, uh, databases available for many uh, most popular open source databases and not just them. What you also see is recognition of that effort in uh, their uh, community, right? Many of you probably heard about, well, data on Kubernetes community, right? If you guys uh, are here, uh, which was going uh, pretty strong. Like a few years ago, then uh, Pircona joined this, uh, this effort where there were uh, less uh, uh, than 100 of our official mem uh, members now it's more than 5,000. So there is like a lot of people interest, not just into running that, but in actually participating in uh, finding a ways how to, uh, how to make it better. Okay. So uh, what is interesting in this case, and this is kind of a stats from uh, you know, 2022, unfortunately, I don't have a more, uh, more recent report, right? What is interesting in uh, this case, what we can see is what for a lot of companies participating uh, in this uh, uh, community, we can see a lot of them are already running number of workloads in, uh, on the Kubernetes, right? And we can see uh, a lot of uh, uh, folks are uh, expecting to uh, increase that. What I think is also interesting uh, in this case is how people uh, think about that. Does that end up for working for them? And what we see in this regard is what uh, people moving workloads to Kubernetes or starting uh, to run the data intensive workloads in Kubernetes are, uh, are pretty satisfied, right? As uh, you can see, we kind of very satisfied or some that satisfied, right? As you know, you typically get asked in mm, the survey. Here is now another uh, legal stats uh, for you, right, if you need to, you know, convince your boss to let you try running a database on, uh, on, uh, on Kubernetes. This is from CNCF, right? So this is not a data on Kubernetes people, also known as, you know, data on Kubernetes zealots, right? This is overall uh, Kubernetes space. And what we can see in this case is, uh, you know, open source monitoring, databases, messaging, right? These are one of some of the fastest uh, growing workloads. What I think is interesting in this case, all of them are pretty much data intensive. Because even if I speak about open source monitoring, guess what, right? It's going to store and process a lot of observability data. So it kind of includes uh, some sort of uh, mm, uh, data store. You know, here is uh, some uh, uh, more uh, interesting stats, right, about uh, their uh, date-related uh, uh, technologies on Kubernetes, and we can see what, you know, databases, right, I think which people mean in this case, like operational databases and uh, analytics are uh, very uh, 
uh, very common, right? And this is kind of a, how what is percent of respondents run different workloads on Kubernetes. Okay, now let's go about some specifics here, right? Hope I uh, provide you some stats in terms of what is, uh, 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 what is a good idea to, uh, or why is it a good idea to run database on Kubernetes. Now, I mentioned the operators, right? What is exactly those uh, like an operator concept I mentioned and why is it important, right? Now, if somebody is responsible for database operations, making sure it runs healthy and so on, right? How do we call that person? Well, that is an operator, right, in many cases. Yeah, you can also call, call it like, you know, DBA and whatever, right? And that is essentially that concept which is now tra uh, translate to the software, right? The operator is uh, the piece of code which is uh, responsible for doing everything which needs to be done with databases. Now, why do we need that? Well, because if you think about your simple application deployment, let's say, hey, I want to deploy 10 copies of a stateless app server. Right, well, you just, you know, uh, deploy them in kind of any order. You can ki kill them at any time. It's kind of all like a very uh, loose and easy. That is not how things work with databases, right? With databases, you have to practice kind of certain, a certain care, right? If you are uh, de deploying the cluster, it has to be deployed in a particular order, right? If you want to, for example, uh, perform the up rolling upgrade, right, you need to, uh, you know, do that uh, kind of carefully, right? So that second part also didn't work, right? Is it? What's that? You good? We're getting audio out of here. You are now. Oh, I see. So I have to say, oh, the speakers didn't work. Oh, that's a figure it didn't work. Uh, but it worked for our uh, esteemed uh, uh, recorded audience. Okay, Th that's good. I thought I have to like say uh, sorry for a second time, right? <laughs> so it finally gets uh, gets to people. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. You just like like playing the flights. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. My kids also did that. Like. 10 years ago. <laughs> okay, back to Kubernetes uh, operators, right? So with databases, you have to have, a, uh, have to have a certain care, right? So there is a lot of logic in terms of managing databases uh, appropriately, right? Like uh, uh, upgrades, backups, you know, scaling up, down, whatever, right? That is uh, what would be done you know, manually by a human operator now can be coded in that uh, operator uh, concept, right? Now, when you talk about the databases, right, we often talk, uh, and many applications in general, right, we often talk about day one mm. and day two, right? Your day one is saying, hey, I have an installation and initial configuration, right? And then day two is the rest. Right, the rest of a database uh, uh, life, right? That's where we have to make sure backup, scaling, self-healing, upgrades, and so on and so forth, right? And what is very interesting uh, with uh, <coughs> databases is they spend vast majority of their life in that kind of day too, right? We, with databases, we cannot generally say, well, you know what, if it's kind of sufficiently fucked up, just to we wipe it up, right, and start uh, from scratch, as we often can do with uh, applications, right? Those days, just you know, uh, they deploy the clean code from from scratch instead of trying to kind of you know modify it. It's very uh, common mm, uh, common approach those days, right? And that is what the operators are uh, very good at, and that is where I would say like an other approach is to deploy the. Uh, database on Kubernetes, you know, just you can take the, uh, you know, uh, MySQL Docker container, right, and throw it into Kubernetes. Well, you can do that, right, and that simplifies your kind of day one thing, but that is not really 
useful for day two, that is where most of the production databases spend vast majority of their life. Now, uh, at your corner, we have uh, uh, built uh, 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 Kubernetes operators, right? And we've been doing that for a while. Right? Our MySQL operator, for example, came, uh, was released as JA years before uh, Oracle came uh, to, uh, to release, this, uh, release them. Uh, and uh, I have uh, made a little kind of uh, tutorial uh, for those who don't have a lot of experience of Kubernetes to show you, right, what exactly you can, uh, you can do with it, right? And you may be pleasantly surprised as how easy it is to do many things with, uh, uh, you know, Kubernetes operators compared to what it would take to deploy, manage, scale, you know, execute backups, right, on uh, their, uh, on the, you know, conventional cluster builds on the M. What also is interesting and why you can see what this uh, Kubernetes, database on Kubernetes approach winning a lot of hearts and minds is what there is a lot of database as a service solutions which have been built uh, recently are actually built using Kubernetes as a backend. Right, like this is just, you know, example of uh, uh, number of folks who use Kubernetes backend, right, and they typically use either, uh, you know, open source, right, or maybe some sort of like a proprietary, uh, you know, or, or operators uh, to, you know, to do that, right? So uh, that tells me two things, right? But if they're doing that, A, well, that means it kind of works, right, if they would be, totally kind of blowing up a customer databases, right? You probably would hear about that, right? And B, that is uh, reasonably efficient, right? Because obviously if it would be like a 10 times slower than running databases on VMs, uh, you know, well, uh, that would be, uh, uh, would be a problem, right? And I think that is, a, that is important point is what, uh, what we see with a recent state of, uh, uh, of Kubernetes, right, the uh, performance overhead from, you know, Kubernetes compared to the same, uh, let's say, VMs uh, is uh, actually quite, uh, quite minimal. Okay, let's now go to talk about uh, uh, specific practices. Now, uh, what I would uh, encourage you also is to uh, be active. If you violently disagree with something, so you know, just tell it here, this is wrong, right? and uh, that will be helpful, probably can uh, do a better presentation next time. The first one is something I uh, already mentioned to you. Use operators, right? When you're looking at the different options to deploy the database you plan to run on database, uh, look uh, for uh, the good, full features, stable operators uh, out there and use them rather than other deployment time. Then second one, which is very important, is set up for high availability, right? Uh, of course, if you care about that in uh, production. An important reason for that is uh, uh, what uh, they're uh, relying on a single instance in Kubernetes is totally not a good idea, right? Like, I mean, if you are, uh, I've seen a number of people just saying, hey, you know what, we deploy the single instance and, you know, on VM or in a bare metal and it actually works and we didn't have a problem for years. Well, remember, Kubernetes was designed with the idea of a treat your nodes as cattle, not pets, right? So if you, you know, uh, if one of them dies, right, it's not like a particular thing to uh, shed the tear about, right? But if uh, you only have a single node uh, uh, where the database runs, that can be mm, uh, uh, the problem. The second thing, which is also mm, uh, uh, very uh, important here, is what you want your data <laughs> to, be, uh, to be persistent, right? And that means, uh, uh, well, uh, the, in Kubernetes, the concept is different compared to your kind of like a, a VM, right, when it's sort of like, or like especially like a physical box. You have a hard drive, right, until you wipe them off, right, the data stays there, right? In case of, uh, of Kubernetes, it's designed for stateless stuff, so unless you specifically stated what I want to keep that state, right, on the persistent volumes, right, it will uh, disappear, right, when that's, uh, 
uh, container is killed, right? Now, for persistent volumes, you can use uh, both the uh, local disks, right, or fast, uh, uh, fast remote storage, right? And obviously, we have a different properties, right? If you use something like uh, EBS, it has a certain level of redundancy built into that, but it's also rather uh, expensive, right, and also rather slow. Like here is uh, an uh, interesting image I grabbed from one of, uh, well, actually our guys uh, uh, presenting comparison between uh, NVMe local storage and uh, their provisioned I/O storage, right, which is another uh, way to get a good performance if I/O bound workloads. And what we can see uh, see here is what even if we are getting like a lot slower, uh, like this kind of like a ten times slower in number of IOPS storage, still costs us like almost ten times as much, right? In this case, compared to NVMe. So if you use your local NVMe, yes, it is uh, non-redundant, and that means uh, in this case you want to make sure you have like a replication on a database level, well, which you often do anyway, <laughs> right? Uh, but it's much more uh, performant and, uh, uh, you know, cost, uh, cost effective. Next thing is uh, keep data per pod uh, relatively small. Right? I think this is uh, uh, interesting because if you look at sort of like a conventional database setup, databases often like this kind of like a big iron, right? And people may say, well, I have this kind of like a monster server with a lot of storage, right? And I run my single Oracle Postgres MySQL, doesn't matter, instance uh, on it, right? Which has, mm, a, you know, like 50 terabyte of storage, right? Or whatever. Uh, that number is well. That is probably not going to be very good in uh, uh, in Kubernetes environment, right? And what that means? Often, look, not every database is very good for uh, 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 for uh, uh, to move to to a Kubernetes, right? In certain cases, like a very large databases, people may not have a very <laughs> uh, very good uh, mm, uh, success with uh, just yet, right? Unless they've been moved to uh, you know, distributed database, right, which you kind of designed more to that smaller nodes. What is also, uh, uh, so yeah, so that is a, uh, not, uh, not a good idea. Uh, the other thing I would consider is the thinking about like appropriate node sizes. And uh, what is interesting in this regard is when you look at application deployments, right, your, you know, normal, App server, app server, proxy, whatever, right? Often, you don't particularly need a big boxes, right? And what I have seen a lot of the Kubernetes clusters out there may be engineered with relatively small node sizes, right? And then you come and say, well, I want to run the database on Kubernetes. Well, and guess what? In this regard, you need uh, uh, probably much larger nodes, right? So the shape of your Kubernetes cluster configuration may be different, right? If you uh, if you are looking to move like a, you know, 64 core node, right, in Kubernetes, well, guess what, right? You need to make sure the nodes underneath your uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster have at least that amount. Okay. Second, uh, or oh, like what, thing number six is to con uh, configure resource, uh, uh, resources in, uh, in uh, requests uh, and uh, limits. So what are those things? Well, uh, if you think about uh, their, uh, uh, if you just have uh, the Kubernetes pod deployed with no kind of hints about how much resources it, uh, it needs, it will be scheduled somewhere and uh, it will be able to um, utilize all the CPU resources, but will not have any guarantees in, in terms of how many resources uh, it will get. In certain cases, it is not bad, right? For example, in development environment, you may say, hey, look, I, uh, you know, just want to use as many resources uh, as possible, but you know what, if a lot of guys are uh, using the system right now, right, and I kind of get uh, less performance, that is okay, right? 
Now, in production environment, we typically want a difference, right? We want uh, uh, to make sure is what the database performance is, uh, uh, is uh, predictable, right? Otherwise, it's gonna become rather hard, uh, hard to work, right? And in this case, you want to make sure, A, you're configuring that, and then often for CPU, uh, we set requests and limits uh, to the same number, right? So it works kind of, uh, in this regard, similar to VM, right? Because if you provision VM, you allocate kind of four CPU cores to that, right? And you're not using some sort of like overcommitting. Well, you are guaranteed those four CPU cores will be dedicated for that VM, and uh, uh, you're not going to get more. Right, but you're not going to get less, right? So here is, uh, let's say, like a three concepts of what you can use. Like one is a shared resources, right, is, uh, 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 which is um, uh, uh, you quite usable for development environment. Then you can have request limits, right, in a certain, uh, a certain shape, right, which you can do. The danger we want to highlight here, right, is if you have, uh, I don't know, let's say, eight core boxes, right, and then you allocate like a, uh, a six, let's say, CPU cores, right, to, uh, to uh, the database resources, well, guess what, right? Only one of them uh, can be scheduled to the physical node, right, a virtual node, right, and you will waste. So uh, in this uh, uh, regard, with the databases, we often kind of want to emulate that um, uh, I would say their uh, VM-like environment, right, where you have like a single sort of like a database pod runs on a single VM, and in this case, we want to uh, essentially keep the limits pretty close to the allocatable mode, right? Or if you say, hey, you know, I want to have a two of them, then, you know, we also uh, want to make sure they kind of fit nicely, not, not allocating mm, a, a lot of uh, space, mm, a lot of, you know, waste. Okay. Next thing, use proper anti-affinity, uh, right? What is uh, uh, anti-affinity? Well, let's say I have a free node database cluster, right, which I want to be uh, uh, reliable. Well, I want those free nodes to be on a different physical servers, right? So even if they're kind of ch chopped in a, in a number of kind of different VMs, well, right, uh, uh, underneath. Right? Well, maybe I even want them to be like in a phys different physical racks, right? So, uh, so that is how you can specify the anti-affinity uh, uh, rules to where to, uh, to make sure you don't have all your eggs uh, in, uh, in that basket, right? And that again depends on, uh, on your requirement in the cloud. You would often say, hey, you know, if you're looking to have a very reli reliable cluster, I would use a concept of the availability zone, right, and, and make a different nodes in a different, uh, uh, different availability zones. Next one is wherever database is, Kubernetes doesn't make it magical. You know, some operators may apply their kind of own, uh, uh, you know, tuning compared to what like a stock, uh, you know, like a Linux package may provide, but in generally still you need to tune your uh, database for uh, optimal results, right? So indexes especially, queries, right? You still need to take, uh, uh, take care of them uh, as usual, right? I think for most of you guys that goes <laughs> uh, uh, without saying, but uh, uh, I've seen a lot of kind of junior developers when they say when we speak like some next generation of technology, they kind of uh, uh, expect magic. Finally, I don't have to learn about all this kind of a pesky database and channels, right? And, uh, right? and then it will just do everything automatically for me. Well, Perhaps some things, but not um, uh, everything, right? Uh, uh, like one of the tools uh, you can consider for that would be uh, PMM. That is an open source uh, software tool for uh, Percona, which has a lot of uh, deep uh, insights for MySQL, uh, MongoDB, Postgres to help you with tuning settings, queries, and uh, so on and so forth. Next one is, it's a very good idea to also to understand the database you're using, what kind of options does it have 
to uh, scale. Some databases, distributed databases, right, they can help you to scale both uh, uh, reads and writes, right? And a lot of, I would say, databases which are designed for the cloud in the last few years, right, they are, or like probably like the decade by now, these are tend to be distributed databases, right? Things like MySQL, Postgres, right, they have uh, des uh, been designed many decades ago by now, right, and they sort of like, they're designed for a single node and then added like a kind of like some clustering, sharding, right, uh, as an uh, afterthought, right? So uh, in this case, if you are uh, thinking about what database can uh, uh, scale out, right, well, uh, uh, we have uh, like a TyDB, for example, right? Do we have anybody from TyDB here? Oh, look at that. We have a bunch of folks from TyDB, right? So if you want to talk about TyDB, come to them. And also uh, Planet Scale, right? Yes. The source survival, survival of a Planet Scale is here. <laughs> uh, uh, great, right? Any other distributed databases? What? Yugabyte. Yes. Yeah. Do we, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, Yugabyte uh, uh, right now. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's um, an ever uh, uh, cool operational distributed uh, uh, database. So, yes, if you are running one of those databases, other distributed databases, guess what? You can scale number of loads and scale read and write, right? In other cases, if you are running MySQL, uh, uh, like uh, Postgres, right? Well, you often would be limited if you need to scale writes, right? You need kind of to scale up, go to larger loads, provision more IOPS, right? If you uh, want to scale reads, well, you probably can have a, uh, you know, more read uh, replicas, right? And well, for non-relational databases, you know, MongoDBs, Cassandras, right? They typically also have some sort of uh, sharding uh, setup. But again, the point here, the point here, right, is to understand how to scale your database so you don't really have uh, wrong assumptions, saying, oh, well, you know what, I now start with one node, but if I grow my database to 50 terabytes, I just go into, you know, run it as a magically distributed database. Maybe not. Also, control eviction priority, right? Well, Kubernetes is something which evicts some of uh, can evict some of the nodes, uh, right? Like in the uh, in this case, to uh, you know, for uh, various reasons, right? And uh, the database nodes are not uh, uh, expensive to do that, right? When you're starting database node, often it would have to do like some, you know, crash recovery if you just killed it, right? It may even if it doesn't have to do that and it was shut down properly, often it will takes warm up to fill its all the buffers, right? Caches. Right, so with database, you don't want uh, uh, Kubernetes to do what it likes to do, right, and mess around all the time, right? Yes, sometimes you want to invict the pod and reallocate that, but you want to tune the uh, priorities. Well, exposing uh, the database, that is not an important thing, right? You uh, want to make sure from security standpoint, you only expose your database outside of that uh, Kubernetes cluster if you need to. A lot of uh, uh, security, bad security incidents happens and people expose, let's say, database outside of their, uh, you know, secure environment, you know, because they just want to, to much more conveniently access it from somewhere, right, and then bad things happen. Kubernetes is the same. Encryption, data at rest, data in uh, transit, you want that uh, encrypted. The good thing about in, uh, encryption, or a misconception about encryption, right? Encryption those days is pretty cheap. Like a modern CPUs, right? They have like a special encryption, uh, instructions to encrypt the data very quickly, very uh, efficiently, right? Uh, uh, that also applies to, you know, to the TLS data uh, uh, in uh, encryption, right? So you typically just want to, uh, want to make sure uh, you use that for uh, extra security, right? And that's typically much better and safer option than kind of just saying, oh, I need to encrypt this data, not that data. This connection can go on encrypted, right? Because mistakes can be very costly and savings <laughs> from not doing encryption are relatively you know, small. Also, 
uh, and other security uh, things, uh, the Kubernetes has a, a pretty good uh, uh, built-in concept as a uh, Kubernetes uh, secret. It's a very good way to pass the database access credentials to your application, right, instead of, you know, uh, committing it uh, or keeping in a source code, right, and so on and so forth, right? Again, like a very, uh, uh, very good practice, right? And you can uh, look at the operators which also support, uh, you know, integration with uh, Kubernetes secrets for you know, things they use. Backups. We spoke about clustering and what you need to have ability in Kubernetes clusters, but hey, it does not eliminate uh, the need for backups which you uh, want to make sure you set up. Uh, as we said, uh, to keep them uh, off a node, off a cluster. We have majority of folks uh, keeping backups in you know, S3 compatible storage, right, or some other uh, object store uh, works, uh, uh, works uh, uh, pretty well. Now, I already uh, flagged uh, some of the folks here, like uh, Vitesse, slash PlanetSk, Neon, Yugabyte, uh, uh, TiDB, right? I think these are all uh, pretty cool databases to uh, uh, to consider because they have been all designed with this kind of new, uh, you know, cloud native world uh, in mind compared to their MySQL and Postgres, which are fantastic databases, but let's face it, they have been designed for a different world, right? And they have been just, you know, adapting for what is the new, uh, new solutions um, uh, uh, can provide. Number 16 is uh, uh, consider CPU choices if you have, uh, e uh, have uh, e efficiently. Uh, in particular, I think uh, uh, if you are on Amazon, uh, look at uh, Graviton ARM uh, CPUs. They are, uh, you know, pretty efficient and uh, 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 relatively power uh, efficient, and I think we think there's like a, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, development, uh, you know, going on uh, out there. Number seventeen, uh, what I would mention is pick uh, what exactly Kubernetes deployment is right for you, right? Because I have seen uh, different teams, some of them saying, "Oh my gosh, managing Kubernetes." No, we don't uh, uh, want to do that. That's kind of another load uh, on that. In this case, you can provide, uh, uh, use like a managed uh, Kubernetes uh, solutions, right, which are available now from a uh, variety of, uh, of clouds, right? Again, uh, they would not eliminate you to, uh, to know uh, the, the Kubernetes, of course, to use it, but, uh, but can uh, reduce some of the toil which comes with the Kubernetes management, right, and maybe, uh, you know, provide some you know, cool automatic, uh, you know, additions. Like, hey, if you deploy the uh, managed Kubernetes on AWS, you can say, hey, you know, manage the scale of my Kubernetes environment automatically, right? If I need more, more resources, you can scale Kubernetes cluster uh, automatically, right? Which can be uh, very cool. I have a folks, they like, uh, the, uh, not manage Kubernetes, but deploy Kubernetes uh, on VM, uh, that has other benefits, right? If you say, hey, you know, I have uh, this particular kind of blueprint, how we deploy Kubernetes, what Kubernetes version, and we want that to be the same on Amazon, Google, and on-prem, then, uh, you know, using some of uh, Kubernetes distributions, right, and just deploying it in different places may be a better choice for you. Number 18, you want also to make sure you monitor uh, the uh, utilization, right? Monitor uh, utilization of your, uh, of your nodes, uh, right? Because it is very easy in a Kubernetes space, right? To uh, leave a lot of resources, right? Which may not be even only used, but which may be uh, not even kind of allocated for possible use. Well, like in that, in that, that picture I showed you, right? Hey, you know what, we have uh, nodes, right? And uh, they just have some sort of slacks which cannot be possible allocated based on how things are con uh, uh, configure, uh, configured, right? So that is a very important thing to save uh, cost. Now, also I think as you are looking at Kubernetes environment, right? And databases uh, deployed out there, 
a lot of them are going to be kind of much more complicated, right? And uh, also as you, uh, if you are kind of deploying, let's say Linux package, you typically have some idea what it installs. Like, oh, I install MySQL. Well, it, I'll have, let's say, MySQL process running. If you install the operator, right, even the, that's kind of operator from your corner, you probably would not have an idea what it installs completely, right? Because it will install, you know, some uh, proxy for load management and then it's going to be, you know, some other be, uh, mm, uh, bits and pieces, right? And I think that is very, it's important to have some tools, right? So you can get that overall picture what runs, right? And what, uh, uh, you know, talks to, uh, to each other, right? There are a number of tools uh, for that. Uh, one of the tools which, well, I'm kind of helping with this open source project, right? It's called uh, 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 Karoot, right? Which is quite helpful in automatically identifying what runs on Kubernetes cluster using kind of eBPF, right? So it doesn't rely on you installing any kind of additional uh, agent, right? And uh, that is how you can right, discover <laughs> what you actually get when you deploy some sort of operator you know, and how those things talk to each other. And also if there are some problems, you can also see mm, where they come uh, uh, from you. Okay, with that, uh, let me ask you a question. So I uh, went through my tips and probably some of you, our Kubernetes experts are sitting right now and thinking, oh, Peter, you forgot this very important thing, you know. Any ideas, anything I forgot, anything you find a very important best practice? Yes. Um, you mentioned about open sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the vulnerability of your code is the most important tool. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, and the same thing with you guys discussing the model, the operator model mm -hmm. you use public and whatever. So when you have to invest in it, then it's a lot of responsibility. Oh yeah, absolutely, right? I think that is an interesting thing, right? Because the data is kind of like so easy to de destroy in Kubernetes environment, you want to make sure it's uh, very careful. Now, what I, mean, uh, what I said, and maybe I wasn't clear about the NVMe, right? Is well, of course you cannot do rely on a single NVMe storage, right? But what often happens is when you would deploy, I don't know, let's say Postgres, you wouldn't deploy a single node, right? You would de deploy the, uh, the replicated cluster, right, of three nodes or, or something, right? Like e in this case as well. Or of course, each of them would have uh, its local NVMe storage, right? And yes, that storage may go down and kill the node. Uh, right, but there would be redundancy because of, you know, two other nodes, right? What will you get with somebody like EBS, right? You essentially have, you know, three nodes. Each of them has like data, you know, like wherever, copied so many, wherever many times, right? EBS copies that uh, internally, right? So that is what we are yes, talking about. That is exactly what I'm worried about, uh, which means that if you use no, no local storage, yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, and uh, you know, I would say it's also like uh, 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 never say never, right? I would say like uh, in uh, certain cases, yes, like you may, uh, your workload may not be even IO bound, <laughs> right? Like to, uh, mm, uh, to to begin with, right? Then that's a less, uh, less of a problem. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, if you uh, look at the uh, upgrades, 
right? And I think that is very cloud is actually very, uh, very nice because you can, uh, you can ex kind of expand, right? And then shrink environment. So what we like in this case is saying, hey, if I'm doing kind of like a minor upgrade, then typically operators can just, you know, uh, run it uh, together, right? Uh, in, in the cluster, it's kind of low risk, all good, right? If you have some major upgrade, it's often good to just, you know, you provision uh, the new cluster, you kind of set up replication, ensure kind of everything works, right? And then you, you can do a cutoff, right? So this kind of like a, uh, the, an approach. Okay, yes? Yes, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, I think that's a, that is a good idea, idea right? We see, uh, we see a mix, right? In a uh, number of cases, you, say, you see people having like a special purpose database cluster because the shape, right, what we see for, for the database nodes, right, they, they need can be different than what is optimal for, uh, for applications. Yeah, well, uh, look, uh, uh, I wouldn't, uh, like, I, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, innovation, right, which goes uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of storage, right? With uh, that, we typically work with what, uh, you know, customers, customers have. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Well, I didn't mention caching, uh, right, and I think there's a lot of uh, tools coming out for that because it's not like really very Kubernetes related. But yes, I mean, I think if you, if you look at this case, uh, you have, uh, you know, a number of caching solutions, right, which can be quite database specific. Okay, folks, now, contrary to a popular belief, that is not the end of the presentation. I just wanted to take a, a brief pause and now I'll get to like a, a next stage and talk about in a few minutes of what is uh, coming, right? One is what you can do beyond Kubernetes operators, right? One thing what we see is for people who are uh, using something like an RDS and saying, yes, you know what? Uh, it's all kind of good and fantastic, but you know what? Having this kind of uh, YAML files, which you do kind of, you know, cube apply, is not like that UX you got used to, right? I want something I can uh, use my click op skills, right, and deploy the database uh, in a few clicks, right? And uh, uh, that is, uh, the, I think, is quite important for certain users. Uh, we at uh, Percona uh, are also be, uh, building the open source uh, product for that uh, called uh, uh, Percona Everest, which is currently in beta. And I would encourage you to try it out, maybe give us uh, some feedback or maybe even kind of some code so we can uh, make, it, uh, make it better. Finally, I wanted to highlight about a couple of things which I think coming in the future, I think which are important. We are working on that stuff. I know like some other people are uh, working in this uh, environment, and some things are kind of, uh, uh, you know, maybe work in one, which is an interesting challenge, is deploying databases across the Kubernetes clusters, right? We see a lot of people saying, hey, you know what? I don't believe in single Kubernetes cluster, right, as something which, uh, uh, which is kind of universally available, right? I want to make sure I survive a, a full Kubernetes cluster failure, and then there are some, you know, solutions uh, coming up. Like, for example, this one uh, is, uh, is, you know, uh, is getting a lot of uh, traction recently. There is uh, some others as well. Uh, we at Percon operators, for example, we do support uh, replication between, right, many of our customers would have, like, a node or a cluster in a different Kubernetes cluster for disaster recovery, but there is no kind of single easy of... Uh, uh, orchestration uh, multi-cluster just yet. Another thing, which is very easy, but I think very uh, nice, uh, uh, is their work going with automating automatic volume expansion, 
right? Because what, what databases they kind of intend to grow, right? And often what you want is saying, hey, I would want to Kubernetes operator to kind of to start with that, I don't know, so 10 gigabyte or whatever volume, if that's, you know, EBS, right? Uh, and then grow it as needed to be larger, similar to what like a uh, uh, RDS and similar technologies uh, need to do, right? And I think what is uh, fantastic in this case is what we are getting the appropriate universal support in Kubernetes for that interfaces, right? With the, with the cloud vendors, right, or other storage vendors, which can provide that storage uh, thing, right? And I think that is very uh, important uh, with the storage innovation that we are getting more and more with that, like a container storage interface, right, as interface to those advanced features, but in a universal way. So we don't have to, you know, code specifically for, I don't know, uh, some storage. Uh, after scaling, obviously that is another uh, very much, you know, wanted uh, by uh, some people. How can we make sure we can transparently scale our databases, uh, you know, up and down, that's what we see in, uh, in the cloud, right, and number of options, uh, right. And I think a related kind of trend of uh, after scaling would be also after suspend for development, right, when I can say, hey, I deploy a database, I use it only so, or every so often for development, why can it just automatically shut down, right, if it's inactive for a certain amount of time, and then I'm kind of trying to connect to that, you know, just bring it up in the background, right, so I don't have to think about managing and kind of spinning up and, uh, and down that node myself. So that is another thing uh, which uh, I know like many people have been talking, uh, thinking about. Finally, ease of migration, right? Everybody, like whatever you introduce the new technologies, right, so you want to make sure it's, uh, uh, easy to uh, uh, to mm, uh, uh, to migrate, right? And um, uh, that is something what we see there. Uh, operator building various tools, right? Saying, hey, you know what? You can see your database maybe from a backup you taken from uh, with, you know the database which was not running in Kubernetes. You take it on a, a S, uh, S3, right? And initialize your cluster from that backup, or having something like as a uh, rolling transition, and you can say, well, you know, you can have a cluster, you can start some nodes in that which are in Kubernetes, right, until you finally uh, migrate there completely, right? So uh, various kind of approaches how to mm, make the uh, migration both easy and, uh, uh, and also not impacting production with a downtime, right, or something is uh, a lot of work, uh, very lot of work going on. Well, with that, that's all I had. And uh, I think I have a couple of more minutes of questions if you have any. Well, so if you think about like the suspend, the, in many cases, the idea in this case is, uh, is this, right? I mean, if you look at a lot of classical databases, we don't have like a quite separation of the storage and compute, right? So what you'd have is some sort of a proxy, and the proxy knows, right, oh, if connection comes and I don't have any backend because the backend is out, I can bring up that backend and then transfer connection to it, right? That's one, uh, one approach, right? If you look at uh, uh, like some of, uh, I would say, like a new generation database like Neon, they can have a separation of the storage or compute, right? So that out there kind of happens more uh, more after magically, right, mm, uh, in this case, because you can essentially spin up the, uh, like, or, or reuse the compute, right, in a, uh, in a very uh, quick way. Okay? Oh, yeah, I think, you're next speaker? No? Who's the next speaker? You are, oh, okay, yeah. And you started at 11, right? No, 11.15. 11.15, oh, oh, okay, that's, uh, yes, good, good. Okay, well then, thank you folks. <laughs>